I've loved stand up comedy for as long as I can remember. I I don't remember a time when I didn't like or I'm sorry, love stand up comedy. I don't. I remember having a VHS tape of Bill Cosby himself. I'm sorry. Uh they didn't they didn't tell you that when you were ten. Um on the v, it wasn't on the back of the VHS that he was a uh, serial rapist. They didn't say that, so I'm sorry. I remember going with my mom. I remember, I remember the first time, and, and I, I've told this story about about Dane Cook. But I remember, um, I remember going to wrestling practice with my uh, captain Nick Ray Hall, who is. Uh, he went to the Naval Academy and is now, I believe, a Marine. Um, I remember being in his purple Ford Ranger that I almost bought, going to wrestling practice. I think it was during like the Christmas holiday. And I remember listening to, I think the name of the album is Harmful If Swallowed, where he talks about like the sounds a uh, parking lot makes and Punch a, punch a horse in the face, I think. Or bees. I think it was a bee. I remember that. I, remember, I, uh, I wasn't a sad kid. Obviously, I had uh, issues, I think. I think everyone has issues. But I was overall happy. But I remember... I remember the I've told about the album, the, the uh, special many times. About John Panette's special, I Say Nay Nay. It was on a burned DVD, and I remember my my whole family watching it, and just like, it's almost like being tickled, you know. Like sometimes someone like, obviously now like sometimes you sit down to watch a special, or you sit, you go to a comedy show, or, or you're just joking with friends, and you like almost know it's coming, but. When like a, when 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 you when I was a kid and I really had no like real understanding of what stand up was I don't think I, I mean I knew they were telling jokes but the, there's a level of funny that it's like you're being tickled and you can't I used to do this thing and I still do it sometimes I haven't had it happen for a while but sometimes you laugh so hard you lose your breath. And it's all, it's kind of scary. It would be a great way to die. I'm so, I mean, I know that's a little bit dark, but I mean, to, to like suffocate because you were laughing so hard. Hasn't happened to me in a while, but stand up does that. Stand up has that, has that power. And I, I never for a second, like, like not even, like I would have guessed I would be a professional tightrope walker before I thought I'd be a stand-up comedian and I'm barely a stand-up comedian but I I never would have thought I was always uh petrified of being the center of attention I didn't like it still I mean I'm more used to it now and I like some parts of it but the I, I I would love to maybe do like a brain scan when I'm on stage and things are going well because I would love to see what part of the brain lights up. I would love to know because it, for whatever reason, it completely stopped my gambling. I was gambling. I don't think I would have been, I don't think they would have done an intervention on me, but it. I was gambling too much. I was doing scratch tickets because... It's kind of hard to go to casinos in L.A. Um, and as soon as I started doing stand-up, I stopped. Not It's not even like I had to think about it. Let me go back for a second. I just have so many memories. I remember I, uh, my, my best friend in, in middle school and high school, his name is Aaron. And his dad, his dad worked... Uh, traveling a lot. He worked as a consultant, and he had tons of points. So I remember he got Aaron and I, my buddy Darren, and then Aaron's girlfriend Carolyn. We went. It was twenty. 
And we went and stayed in Times Square. Like, I think it was the Marriott Marquis. Beautiful hotel. In Times Square. He got us that with his points. And the concierge had free tickets to the Ha Comedy Club, which is now gone. It was in Times Square. And I think we went two nights in a row. And the reason why I remember that I was 20 is I was I was a little tipsy. I had a Long Island iced tea, which was my drink, because I don't really drink. But if I drink, I want to get drunk. Um, it also tastes pretty good. But I, I, I remember the comedian on stage uh, looked at me and said, how old are you? And I went, 20. One, and he made it a huge joke, and it was uh, it was something we still joke about, eleven, almost twelve years later. I remember, I remember going on my trip to look at colleges with my mom and my brother. We 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 were in a tan. Ford Windstar station wagon. Was it a Ford? No, the Windstar was the... Yeah, the Windstar was the minivan. uh, Ford Focus station wagon. There we go. And I had my, my Dan Cook CDs. And I think maybe a Jim Gaffigan. And I remember we, we went all up and down between... Drexel and Philly and NYU and New York and one a couple more which I didn't end up going even applying to but I remember we went to the to Gotham Comedy Club when I was 17 my brother was 14 and my mom and they of course the comic talked about having kids in the audience I I remember I even I don't even know if Joey knows this. I think he might. The first show I went to in LA was one of Ari's shows at the Melrose Improv. His This Is Not Happening uh series. It used to be a a, a show at the Improv. And it was in the main room. I didn't go during the uh during the small room phase. And it was a show about uh, bad first jobs. And I went with my buddy Matt and his his now wife Taylor. And I remember that Joey was on the lineup. And I even I you can it's probably one of my first tweets if you ever if you're ever interested in going to my Twitter at Lee Science. Um. I wrote to him I think later that night because he he didn't he wasn't there. Um. And I said sorry. <laughs> I, I I think I think Ari might have announced it, and said like he he has a TV show or some who knows who knows maybe he got too stoned or who knows why he didn't go. But I I I, I tweeted him. I said uh, disappointed I didn't get to see you, but I hope the TV show goes well. And I I think I'm almost positive he replied. I think he said like oh I'll see you next time or thank you or something. I'll have to tell him about that. But I went to that. I that's what was probably my favorite thing about being in LA. Even before I met Joey, but definitely after. I loved going to stand up shows. I still love going to stand up shows. There's just some even alone. Like I I, I remember I drove down twice. Uh I got um tickets to see Pete Holmes. At Madhouse, when it was in a mall, I, alone, I went to see that. And then I went to go see Segura and Kinane co-headline at American Comedy Company, alone. If you haven't gone to a stand-up show alone, don't be afraid. It is a little weird in line. That's the only weird part, is the line, when everyone else is talking to their friends or girlfriends. But once you get in there, I almost prefer it, because like if I every time I've gone with someone who I know, you're worried about like oh is this gonna be funny? I hope I didn't 
I told him that this guy was funny. This guy better be like even more than me enjoying the show. Like I've, if if he's not funny or she's not funny, I'm gonna look like a jerk. So I like I do like going alone. But I I never thought I'd be doing it. I never thought I would try it. People would ask me all the time when I was with Joey. Augustino Zorda of the Homeschool Podcast thought. I would always ask me, when are you going to start saying, I'm not, I'm not that kind of funny. And, and then, and then I, I, I went and I started. I'm sorry if I, if this is going to repeat it during the podcast. I don't think it is. But I uh, we, I recorded this this week's episode a, a week or two ago. Um, Joey was uh, getting ready to film his CISO special, and there was an open mic in Reseda that Augustino ran, and I went six times, I think six or seven times over a f- couple months. I would think about stuff on the way there. And I would sit at the bar with Joey and shoot the shit and and drink a Diet Coke. And they had some amazing food. Joey would get mussels a lot. And they had, uh, they had like these waffle s'mores, which he would get occasionally. <laughs> then it turned out that place, got, I think it got like a, a, a health code violation. <laughs> um, but uh, it was good. I remember it was fun. Bart Kreischer showed up at least once or twice. I think Josh Wolf might have showed up. And I know Steve Simone was there the first time I ever did stand up. I did I did a few minutes. And I think I talked about I know I do remember. Wow, I think I think I talked about that the the uh security is better at weed stores than it is at the airport. I think that was my first joke. And and Steve Simone recorded it for me. I'm sure I have it somewhere. In my phone. I'll have to check. Maybe he still has it. Um I but and then we Joey filmed his special in Chicago, Zany's Rosemont, right outside of Chicago. And I remember I was I was still relatively skinny then. Um, I, re- I, then I remember that because I fit into the suits. He had me get suits. I don't think it was for the special, but I brought it to the special. I was wearing a suit and he, f- he recorded <sighs> at least two shows, if not four, but at the end of the taping, they started like the crowd started Chanting for I don't remember if he told them I was there or if they just saw me, and I think maybe he called me up. So there was a no, he didn't call me up, but but they started so, chanting somehow, and I I don't think I was stoned. I don't think I was stoned, but I went up and I made a joke uh, about um, about they have something in Chicago called the combo. And it's a hot Italian beef sandwich with a spicy sausage in it. I did I did like three or four minutes, maybe five. And it's actually on the audio CD version of uh, Sociably. Uh, God damn it. Whatever Joey's CISO special was. I'm forgetting the name and I don't want to look it up right now. But then I didn't do it for like a year. I didn't do it. I... I I was scared. I didn't think it was that kind of funny. I wasn't that funny at the very beginning. And then my relationship was very close to ending. I think it ended within a month of me starting stand-up. Maybe two. And Joey had been telling me that there was a an, a insurance office in North Hollywood that was doing open mics. <laughs> and And I'm sure if you go there today, the insurance sign is still in the window. Um, but it was a, essentially a barren room called the fourth wall. And I went there, uh, at least in my head, I went there really to not be seen. That was the goal. 
to not be seen. Because I didn't... I know this sounds weird, but forgive me. I, 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 I love stand-up so much as a fan. And I knew that people treated me differently because I worked with Joey. Not, I'm not saying, like, I'm not the a king. Like, I'm not, like I said, we're watching Game of Thrones. They, they don't call me prince and, and kills anyone who offends me. But they, they're nicer to me than they would have been. A lot of people. And I didn't want to get a a uh, untrue, fa- basically a fake response to my stand-up. I knew I, re- I wanted to really know if I was funny. And I was at the fourth wall. I didn't talk to anybody. I don't think. Maybe after. Definitely not before. I'd be surprised if I did before. And I'm pretty sure Eric brought me up for one of my first times. If not the first time. And I think I got laughs. I think it went pretty well. And it was just. Magic. It was just magic. I, um, going back to the brainwave thing, so that's what was, I wish, I wish I had, there'd been like some sort of stand-up camp, and that there are clubs that do them, and if you have kids who are shy, I can't recommend it enough, I mean, they do so, they, I, I did Taekwondo and Karate to, you're supposed to build confidence, and teach you how to defend yourself but there's something about stand-up that really made me come out of my shell and and, but it it could backfire because if you stink you're gonna feel really bad but maybe not I don't know even just a little laugh at an open mic like I paid to go I paid over a thousand dollars to the fourth wall my first year. I did probably, God, probably close to 1500 because it was $5 a set, and there, were, and there were longer sets too, so some of it was 10 or 15 But I just, I, I loved it. I, uh, I, I turned down dates because I would rather do an open mic. Now, I kind of wish I hadn't. <laughs> um... But I, I got so hooked to that feeling. Because I'm a very shy person. Especially in crowds. But I'm like one-on-one. If I know you, I'm not like a like a uh, socially inept. I can have a conversation. I'm going to keep it mostly on you. Um, but I can have a conversation. But... Like at a party, like when there's circles of groups or like, it, like it would, it would always blow my mind watching comedians like Joey or Rogan or, or really any of them. They call it holding court, the, the term that they use. And, and they sit outside of a club or even just at dinner with someone. Like I've always been very, it's not even stand up. I've been very jealous of people who can walk into a room and, and everyone's happy to see them, and they they laugh with everybody, and they tell stories. And I'm I've, I'm completely, almost completely the opposite. Um, but I, when I started stand up, man, it was like sort of like two different versions of me in a way, like pre stand up and after stand up. So B A and no no B B S and A.S. I just... I don't know. As, as as terrible as it feels to bomb. And it feels... It, trust me, it feels awful. Especially if you think it's going to work. Like if it's been going well. And you try some jokes. And then it's just met with silence. Like just like silence. Oh, God damn it. I hope this didn't stop recording. I, if the video is messed up, we'll find out my fucking, I should turn that off. My computer went to, uh, let me turn this off here, I'm sorry. (sighs) 
where was I? Right, the silence. <laughs> it's just deafening. Like, you start sweating, even if you're not hot. Your mouth go like you. If you think you, oh, I smoke weed, I get caught in mouth. Yeah, yeah. Um, try being on stage in front of fucking ten people, much less hundreds, and 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 think you're telling a joke that that is gonna make them laugh, and they just stare at you, like you're speaking a different language, and they're like, huh? So, but as bad as that feels, like I remember certain laughs I remember a few of my best ones a few of my best ones were I I was doing a Skylar Stone show in the main room of the comedy store first time ever in the main room my first time ever there it's like a 400 seat place and I was so nervous so nervous I remember I remember getting there like over an hour early over an hour. And I, I even, I called my buddy Eric. I called him on the way there. And I, I remember asking him what I thought, what he thought I should do. Because I, I, I usually, I was doing stuff like just what I was working on at the time. I was so new, I didn't really even have a set. And I said, no, you're doing the comedy store. Do what works. And that was good advice. And I remember the comics were in the green room. Behind the com the main room stage, and I mean comics from the history books have been in there, but I couldn't sit in there. Everyone was talking because it was it's normal to them. It's normal to them to be doing that, but I, I, I remember I scared people. There was an old piano in the back with a, a chair sitting there, and I just sat behind the piano. In the dark. And, I, and people were like, oh my god. Like they didn't know anyone was there. And I, I remember I was so nervous. I drank just an empty, like an, a half empty bottle of water that I thought was mine. But wasn't mine. And normally that would freak me out. But I, I was just so nervous. And I went up. And I fucking. I did really well. I got a, I got a, an applause break. I think it was might have even been a standing ovation. I definitely got an applause break. You can ask Ryan Sickler. He came up and talked to me after. He's like, you don't understand. Like, that doesn't happen on your first time at the comedy store. And trust me, I've done, I did not do well other times. So don't, this is not me bragging. I guess it is a little bit of a brag. But, like, I'm not, that's not the point of it. I'm just saying I, I, I remember the way that felt. My name, my name will never be on the comedy store wall. But I, I I always have that. I remember. God, all the clubs in LA. I remember. I I but I I remember the Wilbur Theater, and I, I've told that story, but just briefly, it's the club that are the not club, the theater that I grew up going to as a kid in Boston, Massachusetts, and I, I remember earlier that day I I, I walked the walk. I did a hundreds of not thousands, it's not thousands, hundreds of times. From Emerson College, which is where I went to school, and, and basically, um, basically uh, to where I lived in the North End, and I, I saw old apartments that I went to, and I picked up, I picked up baked goods with, uh, or from a bakery that I used to go to, and I, I it was a, a, it's called a lobster tail. It's not lobster. It's like almost like sort of like imagine like a, a hard croissant, in a, in a, but in a good way. But inside is like I think it's uh, cannoli filling. It's ama- It's amazing. But I remember, I remember my mom came and and Joey had gotten. I think it was like a four hundred dollar. He was he wasn't mad at me, but he was he was annoyed because uh, we were the, we were in town for less than twenty four hours, I think. And he got Steve, myself, and himself each a hotel room because we we had we had uh, we had done 
That's right. We'd done Foxwoods the night before. And I didn't do that well in Foxwoods. I didn't bomb, but I didn't do well. And I was surprised because I'd been doing well. I'd been on like a a little bit of a tear. I, I had flown home to see my mom. And we went, I did a show at a bar in, in Cambridge. No. Yes. Cambridge, I believe. And it was like a back room. And I did really well there. I did really well there, but I did not do well at Foxwoods. And my mom got all dressed up and came in and came in my hotel room. And we were just sitting there talking. And I remember I went on on the balcony with my notes. And I just paced. I just paced and went over my notes. And I was so nervous that I was going to do poorly in front of her. And I, I, I went up first. In front of 1,100 people. Two, two, two tiers of people at the Wilbur Theater. And I remember I remember being to the side of the stage. Just waiting for the, the sound guy to, to bring me up and... I guess nervous doesn't even really begin to explain it, but but the, as as much as I remember laughs, I also I really got really lucky. As as much as as I complain about trolls and all that, I remember coming out when they like I said coming to the stage. Uh, I think he said like you know him as the flying Jew or you know him from the church of what's happening now, and it it. It sounded like they they called David Ortiz to the plate. That's how it it was like they they said Tom Brady, you're the the Patriots quarterback. The place erupted like into cheers. And it, I re- I remember telling jokes and it was it was going great. I, I had a great set, but the laugh that I'll remember, the best laugh. Probably that I got, uh, or the most important one, I guess, is I told a joke, and I don't remember what joke it was part of, but I, I my mom and I laugh, or she laughs at me, because I never like sticky things. I, I, I would, I would purposely get milkshakes, because I didn't like when ice cream cones melted, and I, 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 I hated that, and I, I said. Something to the effect of that, like that I, I, it wasn't even really that funny, that, that part, but it was a silent room and I heard my mom laugh. I was, I made like 1100, I think I did 10 minutes and I made 1100 people laugh for the majority of the 10 minutes. But at that one line that I've never said before, and I'll probably never say again, I'll have to listen to the recording. I'll see if I can find it. I can't promise that it'll be in here. But if I can find it, I'll I'll find it. And I'll put it in. I wonder if the recording picked it up. Because it was almost silent. And then suddenly, I heard my mom laugh. And that that's probably the best laugh I ever got. Because it was just cool to, to do it in front of her. It was just cool to do that in front of her. But now... I say that, and now it's March of 2021. I was supposed to have been in the beginning of my fourth year of comedy at this point. But I'm pretty much paused. I'm I'm two years and two months into stand-up. In the past year, I've done five minutes, four minutes, probably total. But, um... I, I say that to tell you that this on this week's episode of What Was I Thinking, I have my very good friend, Matt Brown. We met, um, that's another funny story. We met at a burlesque show slash comedy show in a basement in Long Beach, California. And I, I believe it was a Sam Tripoli show or... I, Maybe we met at the time I wasn't there with Sam. I don't remember exactly what... I did it twice, so I don't remember exactly which time we met. But Matt is from the Boston area, and we connected. And um, I have him on today 
we tell stories and we we joke but i i i asked him on to for anyone who is thinking about doing stand up or maybe you just started and you're thinking about making the move to a bigger city like i i talked to to matt about what it was like to start in not new york and la and it was very different than my start in la but matt is a great comic, very funny. It's a great podcast that I've been on called Working On It. And and I just wanted to, to talk with him about what it's like to start stand up. And if you're thinking about it, I I hope what I just the the reason why I did that whole diatribe of stories is really just to you know, paint the picture about what stand up can do for you. And what it did for me. And I'm sorry that there's no video in this um, intro. I recorded it. I was recording it. And then my, my uh, I didn't expect to go so long. And, and my Mac laptop went into screensaver mode and stopped the recording. But I, I, I so I, I, unfortunately, there's no video for this intro and outro. There is video for the uh, podcast. I'm putting up all of the podcasts onto YouTube. Um, so go check out my YouTube link in description. And if you want to support the podcast, uh, please consider checking out my Patreon, patreon.com slash Lee Syatt. Or, uh, if you want, um, you could also, if you're thinking about starting your own podcast, I have a Fiverr consulting, uh, service. You can talk about whatever you want, whether your podcast is new or or it's 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 uh, been going on for a while. I've done a bunch of them in February, and I, I had a great time. And I, I'm going to continue doing it. So th- those are the two ways you could support the podcast. Or if you don't feel like spending any money, uh, just tell a friend. I I really do enjoy doing this, and um, I'm I'm looking forward to continuing doing it. Thank you for all the love and support on previous episodes. If you missed the one about uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin for Dummies, with Shahan Kahashian, and I didn't even have that written down in front of me, just my own memory. Um, that one has got a lot of positive uh, reviews. So if you're at all interested in Bitcoin, go check that out. But now is time to uh, talk with my buddy, Mr. Matt Brown. Welcome, Matt. It's been what like a couple months? I think I came on uh, in December to your podcast. Yeah, it, you did, and man, it was. Um, I've been doing the podcast for four years, and it was the best wow. best response I've ever had. Like hands. Oh, down. that's awesome. That's great. I mean, you've had some cool people on there, yeah. and we'll, we'll talk about that in the, in the future. I want to. A, it's awesome that you've been doing it four years. Yeah. But um, for everyone who hasn't listened, I do want to just because it's such a great story. Matt and I met in L.A. doing shows at a burlesque show <laughs> in a basement in Long Beach, um, and it was fun. But like, it's it's just so weird how small this world is, and it turned out that Matt's father, Wayne, uh, was my old boss at a movie theater when I was in high school and college. So it's uh, it's just amazing. How's Wayne doing? Is he doing okay? Yeah, he's doing good, man. And it's it's so weird too that um, not only did we meet in L.A. at a random comedy show, at a burlesque show, but when we met there, like, we also found out we grew up five minutes away from each other, and it took us I moving know. to California. Yep. It's, uh, it's, it's, and, it, and honestly, it shows you, because, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I'm too nice. Like, I, it's, I just did an episode about dating, and uh, an issue I felt like I've had for a while is that like girls don't like nice guys, and I feel like a lot of a lot of people do give shit to nice people, but um, it shows you that you really do have to sort of, especially in the entertainment industry, you never know who you're gonna run into again. So like, imagine if I had been a, like, what if I was a dick to your dad, or like, <laughs> it's like it's yeah. it's nice to know that like nice people actually can survive. So it's good. Like that's, that's what drew, drew me to you. You were nice. Like there's a lot of comics you meet at shows and they ask you who you are. And if, if you can't help them, like they turn around and like, I've literally had like 
when I used to go to the store with Joey, we'd be in the parking lot after in like a little circle. And mm-hmm. some I remember remember vividly. I'm not gonna put him on blast, but this guy went around to like everyone in the circle and shook their hand, looked at me, and just turned. And I was like, oh, okay, well, awesome. But we, uh, I think we connected right away because I knew you. You told me you were from Boston. Did you? Is that was that that must have been it, right? Yeah, we we found out we're both from the East Coast. And dude, to go off of what you just said, man, about LA and people are like, Oh, you're not you're not rich and famous. <laughs> Fuck you. Dude, yeah. that I may I've the first two weeks I was out there, I, I like I learned that. And I was like, Man, I don't wanna create a like community of those people. Like I wanna hang out with just like the real comics that are nice and in it just to cause it's fucking it's comedy, you know, and it's not they're not just like trying to like it's like everyone was like star fucking out there. What can you give me? How many movies uh, have you been yeah. in? And I don't know if it is the East Coast thing, but none of that is appealing to me. Like if I, if I met like Sandler or something, like he's like my guy. I have him right above right, my head. Yeah. You kind of look like him. You look like a young Sandler. I, <laughs> I can see that. I'll take it. But uh, I, like, of course, there's certain people where you're like, oh, my God, you know, but the people that would only hang out with someone just because of what they're doing, man, it it was uh it was it was brutal. And when I oh yeah, it, I I mean I ran into it a ton. And luckily Joey was a good, he was a good mentor in a, a bunch of ways. But he was smart and he like let me know like people would hit him up to try to get to Rogan, and I learned very quickly like that people will send like. My dad, it's it's so funny. Like my dad, I, I'm in Florida for uh, I've been here for a few weeks, and I'll be here for a couple more. But my dad got a message on Facebook that just said, "Like, hey, I'd love to hang out with you and Lee and smoke weed." Like, it's just like, <laughs> like what do you do? Like, they, like they just go down the list of who they think can get them in touch with them, and mm-hmm. it's um, like I I I I, I don't want to put anyone on blast, but did you ever go to the fourth wall? Yeah. Uh, okay, you were a little, you're a few years ahead of me, so you probably didn't need to as much. But there's a a, a comic who was well known and and um, hit it very early, and you can see like I it, it's weird because all you all all I want or I think all anyone wants is to hit the lottery and and become a star and be rich and all like I don't even, honestly I don't even really want to be a star. I'd rather be rich. But it's like it. There is a draw to it, but you, I've seen like you see what happens to people when it when they hit too early, like it kind of messes with their head. And like I want to talk to you about a bunch of stuff, but you one of the many things that you and I have in common besides uh, your hi- our height and our build. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are listening, Matt's Matt's my dream body. Um, <laughs> And he's wearing a shirt for his podcast. I'm working on it, but if I were him, I'd be wearing no shirt. Um, <laughs> but no. he also recently moved back east uh, temporarily. I think I think yours is more temporary than mine is. Yeah. But yeah. you st- you started stand up in Massachusetts, right? Yeah, started in Boston. Um, I have. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the story real quick. Yeah, I, please. I have a um, a whole list of things like I want to do before I die, and okay. it's kind of, it's li- it's like literally a bucket list, and I do my best to do everything on it, and I wanted to do stand up forever. And Wait, are you are you dying? Are you sick? Or are you just something you want to do? No, I, I okay. I'm, <laughs> I didn't know. I, I was like, I thought I know you pretty well, but do you have cancer? Okay, dude. Good well, <laughs> imagine if that's just that's hilarious. Uh, that how that just happened. But um, no, I'm thank God I'm healthy. Okay, thank fortunately, yeah, wood. yeah. Um, but I just I don't know. I've when I was super super young. I, I think too young, I realized that like you're going to die someday and right. I have a whole list of things I want to do and stand up is like, that's what I want to do with my life. It's my dream. It's my, my everything. And, um, on it, I had written down, uh, do stand up before you turn or at age 21. Like that was the latest oh, I could wow. start. So, so, uh, before just interrupt for a second, I remember, 
because we you grew up in this same area. I went. I remember going to the Natick Mall, and going to, I think it was F Y E or did they used to have a Strawberries at the Natick Mall? I know for a fact they have an F Y E, yeah. uh, for your entertainment for all the youngins <laughs> out there. But I I the, I thought it was F Y E. I remember going to a store, and I've told this story, and I, it's unfortunate that it's the person that it is. But I bought the VHS tape of Bill Cosby. Um, himself, I think is the name of the album, and I watched it a thousand. And I was just a fan of stand up, but like, what do you remember? Do you remember like what you saw that made you want to do it? Yeah, uh, anybody watching on video, it's above my head. Happy Gilmore. I I fucking really. Yeah, this is signed by Sandler and stuff. Whoa. Yeah, I it, he is my. I saw Happy Gilmore. I think I was like six, and. <laughs> I just I loved everything about it. I just saw it on VHS. Like it wasn't in the theater or anything, right? And and, then, and but and did you look him up? Because I I mean I didn't even really know Sandler did stand up. I thought he was just in the movies and only like in the last few years. Like oh wow he did stand up. Yeah. Well, it was like it took years. It was like I saw that movie and I remember thinking like w- I want to do that. Like whatever it was. I you're six. Okay. You don't know. I I just loved it. And, right. And then um. I throughout years I would just keep watching the movie and then I realized other people knew who he was and that his name was Adam Sandler and it wasn't Happy Gilmore. Oh, okay. And I'm like, wait a second. Like people like this is a person playing this person and then I learned that he did stand up and got to do SNL. This is all from like age 6 to you know, 12, that I'm just, like, learning wow, all this okay. stuff. So you did a lot of, like, for those of you, how old are you, Matt? Do you I'm, mind me asking? I'm 28. Okay, so you're, wow, you're, like, four to five years younger than me. So you were, okay. Do you remember when you got a computer in your house? I feel like it was, like, elementary or middle school for me. Yeah, I was, um, I feel like my parents got, a, like, a giant thing when I was. Yeah, des- a desktop with a, uh. It, the 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 uh, monitor could kill someone if you threw <laughs> yeah. it at them, and like and like and we had one, we had a family computer in the living room. Yes, exactly. So and like and I had an i I always had uh, hair brained money making <laughs> ideas. So I had an idea because my dad, I'm sitting in a room, my, my my room while I'm here is my dad's normal TV room, and he has like he has like an 82 inch TV, he has 8,000 uh, Apple products. And he he loves tech. That's where I, I get it from. And my dad, we had one of the we were one of the first people to have a computer uh-huh. in our neighborhood. And I had an idea to print pages out from the internet and sell them. Print what kind of pages? Like it's just anything. Like if you wanted to look stuff up, I'd be like, all right, let's. And I never did it. It's a terrible idea. Like, <laughs> no, what that's, are you printing? That's but, cutting edge. But but back then, not everyone had laptops. Had, had, had not even laptops, desktops, and it was dial up. So like, mm-hmm. I'm just blown away that like you would, even at such a young age, be like, let's look him up and see what he did and. Wow, like I don't even know what was around back then. Was like, were well, you on Ask Jeeves or something? <laughs> like I remember. Like, <laughs> no, a lot of it was just like word of mouth in school. Like I, I'd be talking really? about a okay. movie, and then someone else is like, you know, qu- like Salong Sucker, like quoting Happy <laughs> Gilmore, right. and I'm like, right. wait, and I just remember being like, people know that they know Billy Madison, and it was like a, it just blew my mind, and then I like learned that that was his job. And stuff, and right. I was like, "Well, what? That that's all." And ever since then, it's like all I've wanted to do. Period. So, so do you want to act? Is that still something that you're interested in? Yeah, and like what I was saying before about when I started doing stand up, I was too scared at the beginning, and so I just started taking all these acting classes and stuff, and um, I would do like just like sh- like student films and shit. And it was all just, okay. I was just too scared to do stand-up. And then um, that I, my list was on there. My birthday was coming up, and I just uh, did it. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I mean, it's uh, a lot. And that that is, a, there's a few things I want to talk to you about. But starting, because I, 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 uh, I got a lot of questions about it. And it's, 
not I guess it's sort of could be construed negatively, but I think like the podcasts, the comedy podcast genre, specifically mm-hmm. like the Rogan group. And I'm sure the other ones cuz there's like there's the the Nerdist group and and um the alternative uh whatever, but I I would be interested if there was some sort of number that like between the year of 2010 and 2020, the number of people starting comedy went up like 300%. Or, like, I, I really do feel like it really exploded at that time. Partially, not that they made it sound easy, because everyone talked about their struggle and how hard it was and the shit gigs, but... You you also saw the end of the road, and you saw like a Rogan who was selling out theaters, or even at the beginning comedy clubs, and you and Mark Marin, and and you see like the finished successful product, and you're like, oh, it must not be that hard, and it like what I kind of want to do with this podcast. I'm gonna have a couple of my other LA friends on, is sort of to give like a more realistic view of what it's like as a newer stand-up i mean you're what now like are you like close to seven years in i guess yeah wow that's wild um so it's uh and and the the difference is because i started in la which i've heard is awful to do for a variety of reasons but i also started like the internet was huge like the there was and i'm sure you've heard about it but for everyone who is there's a website called the Comedy Bureau in LA which just made it so simple to find an open mic like it's there's really no if you're if you're in LA and you're like I can't find an open mic you're just a liar um because like they they just like they literally for between San Diego and Santa Barbara have almost every open mic and before the pandemic there was like 7 8 9 10 whatever 20 a day of of open mic so it was not easy like you still have to write and go down and and get the nerve to do it but i've heard in other like i um i'm doing consulting on my patreon and this one comic um not arkansas nebraska i always think it's arkansas it's nebraska he is living in nebraska right now and lives three hours from the funny bone and can only do like one open mic like a month or so and then he and then the COVID happened so he hasn't been able to do it in a year but to the thought of having a drive three hours to do like a three minute open mic once a month is just so bananas to me so like so you started seven years ago so you started around 2013 2014 what was it like then for you to find open mics like what was that process like so boston's a little different in that sense than like la and new york and shit so like in boston there the i started it was an open mic but at a club it was for dick doherty's which i th- okay yeah it was um it wasn't the vault, which uh, you went to school near, right? Yeah, right. We, I, I, and I had a terrible day at so Dick. Oh, Do- yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It so- was it was amazing because I was very jealous uh, because when I was here, I graduated in 2010, basically 2011. There was no Laugh Boston. There was right. Dick Doherty's had a uh, the vault and maybe one more, but Faneuil Hall was closed like mm-hmm. when I would go see comedy I would go to Improv Asylum in the North End which is improv. Yeah. Um so so there was Dick Doherty so you started that you started open mic there. Yeah, and it was on Sundays. So every Sunday I would do a mic and then um I I think it was after my second or third time I I don't remember this comic was like, "Hey, you I it mu- yeah, whatever it was. They were like, hey, that was kind of funny. You should come to this mic. It was at the Burren. It's this place in uh, Somerville. It's a bar. Okay. And they would have this show in the back bar at like 10 o'clock, and it would go till, you know, 1230 or 1, and everyone in there was just drunk, like just drunk Boston. And um, Was it a show or a mic? It was... So, like, Boston had bar shows. So, what it would be, 
it would be set up kind of like a showcase. So there'd be like 10 comics on it. Right. And everyone's doing like 10, 5, 10, or 15 minutes depending on what. Wow, you got that after like only a couple times going on stage? So like my first few times there, it was five minutes. And then I would go and hang out all night and not get to go up. Or I would, um, like, they they had this thing where, like, all the regular Boston guys, they'd all go up, do, like, 10, 15 minutes. And then they used to have a thing for new guys, and it was, like, a competition. And oh, okay. And they would have, like, five new comics do five minutes, and then the winner won 50 bucks. And so nice. the first night that I did the show there, I won the 50 bucks. And Damn, it's like and Vegas. They get you the first time. <laughs> yeah. And so... Then when I went back, I would always just, I would, dude, I would like email like an asshole all the time. And then I would text the dude who ran the show at the time. And then when he wouldn't answer, I would just show up and I would wait and be like, can I do a spot? And it, like all the time it was no, but because I went that time, won the 50 bucks and I just went, then they started giving me five minutes. So like every Wednesday I was doing five minutes and then I would, wow. and then I would go Sunday night. And meanwhile, that show is for typically like eight drunk people. And then right. once yeah. in a while, it would be awesome, though. Like for some reason, because all the colleges were there, there'd be like a bunch of college kids and stuff. And then the show would be right. real cool. Oh, it, I mean, and, and it's it's really weird. Open mics are obviously where you have to start. And I'm nowhere near being done with them. But it is what I've noticed, especially like even just going up to Bakersfield when I was in L.A., is like the open mic there. Unfortunately, it closed. It was called the Rocket Shop Cafe. The open mic, because there wasn't much else to do in Bakersfield, got like fifty people. So like, yeah. even though like there's eight drunk people in that bar, you learn a lot more there, and you and it's at least I feel like it's more a better use of your time there. I, I and it's like I struggled with something even at open mics, that I would get really pissed if I felt like I didn't do well. Mm -hmm. Even at open mics, which I learned, I got a really good piece of advice from a comic named uh, Johnny Rock, Johnny Roque. Uh, he said, like, like the point of an open mic is not to make people laugh. Like, if, if you get laughs, that's a bonus. But the point of it is to to take what you've written and just get it out and say it and see it. Because... Like the problem with open mics, and even though like some of like some of my best times ever were at the fourth wall, but like especially once you start to get to know everybody and you start becoming friends, like you'll 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 waste some sets because you'll be trying to make them laugh or like you won't be as serious or they'll laugh at some dark dirty stuff that normal humans would would lock you up in jail for saying. <laughs> so it's like it's um. It's pretty cool, even though it does. It sounds like you didn't have as many opportunities. You, it, it, it's like I know comics who spent years in L.A. and and didn't even get to go up at the Sycamore Tavern. Like it's just, it's a, uh, it's a hard thing. So you, so you had Sunday and Wednesday. Yeah. Did, like how, how soon did you start going out? Like multiple night, like like almost every night of the week. Well, what ended up happening was. Then, so there were only so many shows in Boston and right. uh, it, it's basically like a bar show. And then there are like the, the open mics, but what ended up happening, Dick Doherty's, um, you know, they were, they were really good to me. And a lot of people have different stories and interactions with them. Yeah. Everyone's different. Yeah. And, um, I like, there's a bunch of famous examples from, cause a lot of, like, uh, people started out there, just whatever. Um, but they were really good to me. And about three months in, they started having me host weekends at um, the place called The Den in Boston, which is no longer there. And okay. at this place in Worcester, which to this day is one of my favorite rooms to ever perform in. I've probably done a couple thousand shows in there. and What is it called? Well, probably a thousand, but... Yeah, it was Dick Doherty's, but they had, um, okay. it was, yeah, it was just upstairs at this, it was like in this attic of this restaurant in Worcester. Uh, Is it still of, there? Um, no, it's, uh, I think it, it turned into something else, but 
I think COVID got rid of it. This is the Woo Ha Ha now, which I think is owned by the same people who own Laugh Boston. Yeah. And but I, that's where my mom lives. So, like, what I'm hoping once we get the vaccine and the world opens back up, it'd be great to have, a, like, a legitimate club 10 minutes from me. Yeah. No, for for real, and that opened right when I moved, so I haven't I haven't performed there, but I've heard only okay. good things. But so so you were saying you, you, you the Dick Doherty was good to you, and you you did a lot of shows in Worcester. Yeah, and that place that's where I started to learn a lot because you know I'm brand new, and on the weekends they were selling out in Worcester, and you're in a room, it's a small room, and it holds eighty people. And when there's 80 people in there, it's like crammed. It probably should have held like 65. So there's is 80. It, is it sort of like stage two at the Ice House? Um, yeah, a lot like that. But low, the ceilings were even lower, and there was Whoa. a bar in the corner. And dude, it, it would everyone is just sweating. Like no matter what time of year it is, because there's just <laughs> right. people crammed in there, and it smelled a little weird. And everyone that went there was just like a hardworking New Englander, and which is Sounds perfect. My for fucking comedy. exactly, and it's my favorite. And um, I'm a few months in. I don't even have five minutes of comedy, but they're giving me a five minute spot, and I'm hosting. So I'm going up at the beginning of the night, and I have to get everyone's attention, you know, and everyone's talking and ordering their drinks and all this shit. And there's eighty people not listening to you. And, right, and the, yeah, the Worcester crowd is, isn't known to be the most uh, welcoming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and keep in mind, look how young I look now at 28. I'm 21 up there, and I weigh like 145 pounds, and I'm just like, oh, like, look at me. And I'm, I'm, I'm still in the phase of like combing my hair to go on stage and like trying to figure out who I am wearing, you know, like these button up, like this bullshit. And right. I'm trying to get people to listen to me tell a joke about seagulls and shit. And, <laughs> <laughs> and that stuff, man, it formed everything for me because I figured out how to get the attention of people. I put five minutes together that worked on a paying crowd. And throughout time of just doing that, different headliners and stuff would come through and they'd be like, hey, I have a show for this fundraiser next weekend. Would you like to host it? And then I got 10 minutes of material and then people would be like, hey, would you like to come open for this fundraiser? Would you like to do this? And it slowly unraveled. And while doing all those shows during the week, I would I would do the burr in, especially at the beginning. I kind of stopped doing that in the middle, but I would I would go there and then I would drive an hour and a half every Tuesday to do four minutes or five minutes at an open mic. Wow. In. Um, uh Quincy, Massachusetts, and I would do that, and I would just go up as much as possible, and a lot of the times the shows sucked, and then um, this show that I love, and the place just closed because of COVID, uh, this place called McGreevy's in Boston, had been Mm -hmm. around forever, and um, my friends started a show in the basement, and dude, it was my favorite, favorite, favorite place ever to work on material and people would have to stand everyone was drunk it was a monday and tuesday night i would go there every single week work on new material and the great thing about that room if material worked there it like worked anywhere on the weekends so i I just loved it and i would just try everything you could get a real grasp and um yeah it's it's weird i i and and trust me it's like it's like the same thing for podcasting is it was stand-up is like I've been on great shows that have had four people in the audience, mm-hmm. and it's it's just so hard to promote. Like I was I was just sitting here thinking I spent f- three years basically at Emerson, and I didn't really like Emerson people, and I hung out with my friends from from high school and the, well, that I worked with. But like there'd be nights that I would have been I would have loved to have go see a comedy show, and I just. I feel like I would have remembered seeing anything about like it's just it's 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 sad that there's really not a great way to promote those shows and it's so like it's so cool because a you might see someone who's really great working some stuff out or b like you'll see some like how cool would it have been 
and uh, to see I don't know Dane Cook working it out, and like you could see him like years later. Like the, it's too bad that like a lot of times the big shows are the only one that get people to go, and it's 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 so hard to get people to come out to a show. Yeah, and that was the thing, man. Like, don't get me wrong, like most of these shows were just so weird and like there would be no one there and everyone would be drunk. I'm talking about like the shows during the week, like, right. And, um, I would also drive up to New Hampshire all the time. Um, I would like finish work or whatever during the week and then drive up to New Hampshire and do mics there. And then after a while I would know the people that were doing the mics and they're like, you're driving from Massachusetts. We'll set you up with three shows that night. So I would like drive to one bar in New Hampshire to another to another and then go home. And a lot of the times you show up at this place and there's like, you know, maybe 11 people there. Most of the time they don't even know comedy is going to start. Like they're they're like. And they're not (laughs) happy about it either. No, not at all. It's like Wednesday. They're like, we're going to go out to eat with my you know, husband or wife or whatever the fuck. And then all of a sudden we're, we grab a mic in the corner of the restaurant and start yelling at them. (laughs) Right. And we're a few years in and it's just brutal. We're like, listen to me, like, you know, so, Oh God, it's It's, uh, everything. Like this goes back to what I was saying earlier about being nice. And it's like comics can be a tough crowd, but it's also, they're very generous people, especially if like, if they see that you're working. Like you just said, like they gave you three minutes. When I went up to Bakersfield, if I called, they'd give me 15 minutes to. I never got a 15 minute set, and that barely ever in LA. And like it's, it's a, there's a lot of similarities between comedy and podcasting because it's so hard to like getting guests is a very hard thing to do for a podcast and for a comedy show, even if there's a lot of comics, there's not a lot of good comics. So like, it's like just the fact that to, uh, that you're a good guy and that people see that you're willing to, to, to not just go to one open mic and you're willing to drive an hour and a half. Like I, one of my questions was was like, how do you book a show? But like, unfortunately it's like, you just got to start going to some open mics and, if you're halfway decent, eventually someone's going to invite you to do another show or about another open mic. And yeah. it was, it's one of the things that I struggled with at the beginning of comedy because I'm a shy, introverted person. Like, I, I kind of like being home. Like, like the, this pandemic, I, I, this is a little bit much, but a, a lot of it, I, I don't really mind being home watching TV, like, <laughs> by myself it kind of suits me but like i had to force myself to like learn to like okay go do at least two to three open mics a night and and say hi to people and then buy a drink and it's um it really is like a a symbiotic thing it's like we all need like we're all in competition but we're also not and like we all need each other because especially at the beginning you don't have an agent and you don't have a like there's no comedy club booker who's going to give you a set it's like it's you do a show and if i put you on my on mine hopefully you'll put me on yours and and hey like when i went to i did skank fest i i don't know what it was two or three years ago now um and lewis was great to me but i got two sets in new york and um i'm a big comedy fan and skank fest is one of the really it's an amazing festival but I, I wanted to like, it, I, I, I remember going to comedy shows as a kid in New York and I remember loving New York. So I immediately started reaching out into other comics and, and I ended up getting like 11 shows in four days just off of friends. Like, and it wasn't, I'm, I'm sure a couple of them, one was from Felipe. So that was something that, that not most people couldn't get. And I was very, I like, I was I was very lucky to have the the uh, the f- network that I had, and people were very generous to me. I did a lot of like I I did the Wilbur like two years in, like I should yeah. that should never happen, and it's it's honestly one of the best memories I'll have of, of my entire life. That's awesome. But it's um that most people don't have that, and it's it's just it's a 
It's because uh, you see a lot of people. It's funny. You'll be at an open mic and like you'll be talking with your friend and suddenly you'll just be like, where did Jim go? <laughs> like we haven't seen him for six months. And like, <laughs> you, like, like suddenly people will just disappear. And it's um, like I'm at a place now where I'm ex- I do miss it. And I would love to continue doing it, but I don't. I don't really have any expectation or even hope that it'll be something I do for a living. Like I, I like I, I just miss it for like the social aspect of it, and like I'm not an athlete, so the fact like if I could make, like the the idea of making a room of of twenty drunks laugh right now, like for the lack of a better word, gives me like a boner. Like I'm just like, yeah, let's like <laughs> yeah, that. Dude. It'll be so great to just like, like there's like as bad as it feels to bomb. It feels just as good to do so like to do well. Like yeah. maybe it's a, bombing, I guess feels a little bit worse, but when you like, I remember I, I was talking with someone today about Austin because Rogan moved there. Now the entire comedy world is moving there. Um, <laughs> But the first, like, legit road club I got to do, I went with Joey to Cap City, which R.I.P. unfortunately closed. Yeah. Um, and so I was there Thursday, Friday, and Saturday early show, he let me do three minutes. And I went up, and I I did it fine. It was, it's always a little bit easier in front of the podcast crowd and i'm not upset about it it, it feels great when yeah. all those people laugh but it's it's sort of like uh when they know you and they like you they're already ready they're already basically laughing and it's it's not it's not the same as going up in people in front of people that don't know you but i was so new i think i was like two three months in i i remember uh, for those of you who in austin or anyone who's been there if you're looking at the stage stage right no, what's your stage right? Is it the the? It's the audience is right, the performers left. There's a little like walkway to get up, and there's some tables, but there's also a wall that the audience can't see behind. So I remember doing my three minutes, and ha- putting the mic down and walking off, and I didn't even go back to my seat. I couldn't make it to the back of the club. I went and put my back, I uh, hid behind the wall. And I I leaned up against the wall and for like what felt like like five to ten minutes my legs just started shaking like like all, it was like when you do the UFC and like you hear about adrenaline dumps yeah like I just had so much adrenaline <laughs> from being in front of a sold out audience like literally I was yeah. shaking and That's it funny. was uh, just wild like do you remember like we you've talked about hosting but do you remember like like a real like important set to you yeah first of all you were telling that story and talking about how like you're going behind the stage and like put your head on the wall and i'm like i'm like about to get emotional because i thought because i've had those moments where you're like oh i can't believe this is real and then you go in that my legs couldn't <laughs> stop shaking <laughs> yeah that was hilarious um it's true but that's just not where i thought that was going uh but yeah man like for it's such a comedy you have to love it like um, I don't know if I said this last time you and I spoke, but Whitney Cummings has this thing that I think about literally every day of my fucking life. And she was like, um, you don't choose to be a, it, like, uh, you don't choose to be a comedian. It's something you have to do. And mm-hmm. it, it's such a grind. And to just go off like what you were saying, man, like the, you, when you said like loving the bomb, like that, that's a big part of it. I've, I grew to go, you know, the great shows are awesome, but there's so, especially at the beginning, there's so many more just shitty, shitty, shit shows. And you learn to love that experience and to sit in those moments. And instead of being scared with it, you form like this relationship, not, not to sound like a cheesy douche, but like you, you, you form these, like this relationship with that weirdness and that uncomfortableness and those moments become comfortable and you love that. Like it's more, I always said in those moments, it was the crowd felt weirder than I did. They're like nervous right. and feeling like awkward. And I'm like, I oh. love this moment because you See, feel honestly, weird and I don't. 
on I that that's your experience because I had just I had just started my third year. I was like two years and three months into it when the pandemic hit. So I don't consider myself three years in. The last year was nothing. Um, but like, I I got to be honest. I it doesn't affect me as much as it used to. But like, there's a club in New York that I did twice, and I I did not do well at twice. And now I don't want to go back. <laughs> like it's like I'm I still get ups like it like it gnaws at me like when I don't when like the worst is when you have like two shows in a night and the first one goes well and the yeah. second one you bomb yeah and then you can't go on stage for like at least another day or two like it's 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 like having a form of OCD I think like I just I just start like you like you suck like why did you do that second show you're terrible like it's <laughs> yeah. I, I I'm not at the place yet where I enjoy the bomb I still I still want to want to jump off a bridge when I bomb like that well I, I gotta like explain that because if, if I'm at a club and that happens I'm pissed at myself okay but because okay. like if it's like a paying crowd it's a club you've done the bits before like chances are you know you're you're fucking up but like I'm talking about the weird rooms and the strange oh, shows okay. and then you're in someone's okay. backyard or you're on a rooftop somewhere and it's just strange <laughs> like right. I love that because that's no other art form has that what the fuck's happening right now. You know, if a guy is <laughs> playing the guitar, he's playing the guitar and people can just go about their night and like drink. But when you're when you're doing stand up and it's fucking weird, it's just weird for everybody. And Did you ever do Robin Hood in, in North Hollywood? No. I don't think uh, so. Amir Khalil ran it. It was a mic and it would run from like eight to midnight or something like that. And it it was in the back room of a british pub but like the stage changed a bunch of times but the last place the stage was was in the middle like literally the middle of the room on a, a brick fireplace that you had to step up on top of the fireplace <laughs> yeah. and you had to play the four sides of the room and there was literally like poles in the middle yeah and people would come in like i remember once there was this like hasidic jewish guy in there that like would just was trying to have a in a meal and a a drink by himself and every comic was just going after him and it but like it's that's true i i have i got to a place where stuff like that wouldn't bother me as much but i gotta like it it, it takes some sort of zen like do you know how many years it took you to get to that place where like even a bomb at like a bar show wouldn't affect you it's so what i like to explain that though like bombs would af affect me because i was like i want to be amazing at this you know right like i don't like if I, I bombed or something that shit like i fucking hated that you know especially if i felt like it was literally my fault not circumstance i would be like what the fuck but to be comfortable with just like trying bits and if it got weird being able to sit in that i don't know maybe like three and a half four years in i like okay I started kind of, like, just not giving as much of a fuck of, like, I don't know. Because I, when, when I say I don't give a fuck, I don't mean I don't care about how I'm doing. Like, I want to do right. well. But it's more of, like, the attitude or something where you're just like, ah, I'm, I'm not worried what they think of me. Maybe that's what it is. You want them right. to laugh, but you don't care what they think of me. Got so it. that so was I like skip ahead. three and a half. I want to skip ahead a little bit. Okay, so got it. Three and a half. So, um, I when when did you make the decision, and what what were like the factors where you decided it was time to move to L.A. That I wanted to do that forever, and I was gonna do. I wanted to do it forever, and what finally made us go was I had I had like 35 minutes that I loved and I I was like I have 35 minutes I want to I had about an hour but I had 35 minutes that I knew I could just throw out and do mm -hmm. so I was like I, I feel ready and I knew a lot of people at that point because of Laugh Boston different comics would come in I'd meet them to go back to what you were saying like hanging out is how I got so much stuff because comics, they look out for each other. If you're a fun hang, they're like, come do time, you know? Right. And 
um, enough of that had happened. I've met enough people. I felt like I had the material. I was at a place where I was comfortable on stage and yeah. And I was able to save a little bit of money to be able to move out there. Not like a lot, but I, I got, um, this, this job I was doing and I was getting a lot of comedy gigs on the weekends and I was able to put enough money to be able to put out rent on in California and start there. So that's what it was. It was just like uh, experience and time. How many years were you in? Five. About. Okay. About five. So uh, what were, the, just from the, like the, from your point of view, what was the difference between the two scenes, Boston and LA? So um, Boston is, it's a much smaller scene and um, LA makes you a better comic for sure. Because in Boston, it is bar shows and it is clubs. And um, it, you see a lot of like the old Boston guys in town. Because I, I would get to do like the Kowloon and stuff, which you and I talked about. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. And you see a lot of like the guys that have been there since the 80s. And I don't know. You can you can get away with more generic material in Boston for sure. Okay. And because in L.A., you're going to the comedy store. And you're seeing Joey Diaz and Bill Burr and Chris Rock and Joe Rogan and Whitney Cummings and all these fucking national famous headliners. So I feel like there's a little you have to be a, a, that much better because what people are just seeing in town is better. OK, that makes sense. But I think Boston is a good place to start. Because you get a foundation, you can get comfortable, you go on front of weird crowds and angry people and, um, you know, like a drinking crowd that's rowdy, like, you can figure some shit out, you can get some material, and then you can go to LA and get good. <laughs> right. So, what I want to talk about now is, like, uh, there's so many comics who I know move to Austin, and I don't, I honestly don't really understand it. Um, I know, I know that it's open-ish, and you can do some some stand up there but like what what was the thought process behind moving back to Boston cuz like I know a lot of people myself included like looked at me moving back was like oh did I fail and like I I honestly I think there's a difference I think if it was normal times and like you lost your job or you weren't getting spots and you moved back like it's okay but it is a, a kind of like a failure but now, like the way I look at it with the pandemic, I look at it like a like a smart business move. Like so, like for example, there's a there was a, cha a restaurant chain called Soup Plantation or Sweet Tomatoes. It was just a, a salad bar soup chain, and they closed. Like my I, the only reason that I know it is because my dad went crazy for it. <laughs> but like they closed like ninety restaurants within like a month of the pandemic starting, Whoa. and. Like, they just saw the writing on the wall. And I look at some of these other restaurants and businesses that struggled for a year and probably will be, like, two years at least and just burned through so much money and, and worked so hard and, and they're going to, like, they're going to have no savings and, and, and they're going to lose a lot of stuff. It's like, was that the thought, press, thought process behind moving home? You're like, listen, th there's no reason to pay L.A. rent right now. Might as well save some money, go back, be closer to family, and LA will always be here. Yeah, it it was it was pretty like simple, straightforward. Like if the pandemic didn't happen, I would still be in LA. So right, it has it is like when you talk about like what it, you felt like it could have been failure or something. If the pandemic didn't happen, you and I would both still be in LA, and right. the only reason that we came back was because it was the pandemic at the time it, it was September, you know, shit shut down in March. It was September. Nothing was still open. And we were like, it's going to take a while for LA to jump back on its feet. It's going to take a while for anywhere. And I figured, you know, if everything shut down, we might as well just be near family for now. And because if, I, if I'm not doing shows in L.A. and I'm not doing shows in Boston and I can still do my podcast, you know, I've kept in touch with everyone and it's been a great 
thing to keep doing during this. So we were just like, right. let's just go home. My sister just had a, a, a second kid. My girlfriend's sister had a kid. So we were like, let's just go home for a, a, a year and then move again. So that's right. That was it. Okay. okay. Well, I, I, uh, I, like, <laughs> you know. I'm, I'm in Florida right now with my dad. And th- I, I heard it's been. Is it snowing right now? Is it? I, I heard it's been Bro. awful up there for like, like Dude. this last. M- I picked the right time to come down here. Apparently, my God, I've I've shoveled more fucking snow in the last month than I did in the last four years of my life. Oh God, I feel so bad. My cause I went up there to help my mom, and we. I think there was like one or two storms that we had to shovel for. And literally, like the week I left, it snowed like four times. But she's doing she's doing fine. But Good. I, uh, other than that, I don't I don't miss the that weather at all. Nah. So I, I want to um, finish up by talking about your podcast. It's called I'm Working on It. Yeah. And you've done it for a while, and it's it's impressive because a lot of people a start podcasts and fail, and b you 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 don't have a ton of like high level connections like you can't call rogan or whatever mm. but you you you've worked really hard at it and you've had some like you've had mark normand on mm-hmm. uh you've had a bunch of other like high level comedian guests and i just wanted to like hear about that like like when you started it how you go about getting your guests like just give me a little bit of a rundown yeah so um <clears throat> first of all thanks again for doing it man like of course I, you did that what five weeks ago or something I get I I'll send I get messages every single day still. Oh, that's so cool! Every single like a hundred percent of days, people. I don't know, man. Like you have a real supportive fucking group out there. I, I'm very lucky. Yes, and um, and that's for real. But four years ago, I started it, and um, it it's it was just interviewing comics in Boston and. The whole point of it was kind of just to get that green room, green room feel of like what it's like to chill with comics, and mm-hmm. it's called "I'm Working on It." So we would just talk about like what people are working on and stuff. Like when you came on, you talked about your weight loss and stuff, and uh, you could tell that you're still doing it, man. And wait, <laughs> wait, you can tell that that I haven't lost the weight. Or no, that- <laughs> no, you could tell that you have. You can tell you, that you you're still you're losing weight. You got a long weight. ways to go there, Lee. No. <laughs> what the fuck? Literally the opposite of what I was saying. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I was saying you can tell that like you, you're you still working out. Uh, oh, I'm yeah, hitting I am. on I'm, you. I'm, you I, you, no, you I, realize I, it? Trust me. Trust me. I'll, 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 <laughs> we'll, we'll stop this recording. I'll take my pants off right I'm now. trying so. to fuck, bro. No. That's hysterical. So um, okay, so that's so why I've been in a relationship for nine years. I say a nice thing to someone, a girl slaps me at the <laughs> bar. I'm like, no, I mean, I like your tits. It's, it's right. all fucking, I mean, uh, you're a nice person. Oh, but oh my god, yeah, no, you just like I could tell that you're still working out. Um, Thank you very much. Marry me, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. So I, I would just have comics on, and we would talk about what they're working on and all this shit. And I did it for a while, and then I started to like do a million different things. I did, um, I was getting influenced by too much, which I never let myself do. And that, it, that was hard for like a year and a half. I kept like going, Oh, this person does this. Should I try to be more like that? Should I do all this shit? Right. And I did that off and on for like a year and a half. And then I was doing solo episodes and then I would have guests on. And then, um, like during the pandemic, I, stopped the podcast for like a couple months and I just regrouped and I said just be yourself and I I went through this whole fucking thing because of the pandemic and stuff and I finally wasn't like busy all day doing shows all night writing trying to do this trying to get that gig doing this podcast and I just like let go and I started meditating and all this shit and it fucking wow it changed my life man and I was able to find what I found when I first started the podcast and first started comedy and what I had done my whole life, I was just able to like find my, like who I am again, like to be just me. And, um, which sounds cheesy and shit, but it, it's true. Like, no, it's what makes a good podcast and a good comedian. I, I just had to like find myself again and just be myself and I said, fuck it. I don't really give a shit what anyone thinks or says. I haven't my whole life. Why change that now? Just be me. 
and have on people that I want and I like and that I've met and that I think are interesting that I look up to. And I started doing that like four months ago and more people started listening in the last four months than the first almost four years. And I, I fucking swear it's cause I was finally just going back to my roots and just being me and like buddies like Mark Normand and shit were doing it. And, um, yeah, people just started listening. That's awesome. And, and what, what was, what was your process? Like, how did you reach out to like a Mark Norman or, or your bigger level, bigger guests? I just, you know, I've doing stand up for seven years. You just meet people and I, okay. So you, you knew them already. It wasn't like a cold email. No, I, I like people that I would have been like too worried to talk to or whatever. I, it was rooting back to like, all the meditation and shit. I was like, man, just be honest. Just fucking, you know them. You bumped into them. Like Mark, I I never had you know hour long conversations with, but we had done a couple shows, ran into each other, had good interactions. So I was like, fuck it, I'll ask him. And then he was like, yeah, and, that's awesome. And yeah, no, you just gotta get out of your own way and just add, like a lot of times you're like, oh, maybe they they, ne- they would never want to do it, but uh, the, you you don't know until you ask. And as long as like there's a level of like ask and if they say no or they're too busy that's fine versus like continue like being a pest and like then people will get annoyed with you but Mm -hmm. yeah it sounds like you went about it the right way yeah you do have to have somewhat of a inkling like a relationship with the person i think like even you because like we knew each other and had talked briefly but i was like I wonder if Lee would do the pod. I'm interested in what he'd do when we met. He was really fucking nice and cool, which was nice to find, especially in L.A. Yeah. And then we um, found out that we've basically known each other our whole life somehow. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I was, like, happy that I, I reached out and that we did that because... Absolutely. Yeah. That's Well, that's awesome. I I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I, 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 we always have a good time together, so we're... We'll have to come back on each other soon. Do you want to give your your social and, and just tell the people the name of your podcast again one more time? Yeah, the podcast is I'm Working On It with Matthew P. Brown. It's available everywhere. And uh, four months ago, I started putting everything on YouTube. So um, people are slowly going over and subscribing. Everyone still seems to kind of be listening on iTunes. But um, go over to YouTube and subscribe, please. And same with iTunes. It's on Spotify. It's Google. Like, literally everywhere you get a podcast. And... Um, yeah, it comes out every Wednesday. I just started a Patreon, and I'm gonna be nice. putting up solo bonus apps and stuff. And uh, uh, my po- my uh, Instagram is Matt P. Brown. So that's all. Well, awesome. Well, everyone, please go follow him. And and once this god awful pandemic is over, if you see he's doing a show near you, definitely go see him. Very funny, very nice guy. And um, thank you so much, dude, for coming on. Yeah, thanks, man. This was I loved it. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Matt, for coming on. He's a great guy. I can't. I still can't believe that his dad was my manager at the movie theater in high school and college. I guess. Wow. Yeah. So shout out to Wayne and Matt. Um, if you want to follow Matt, his Instagram handle is Matt P Brown. His podcast is I'm working on it. He's had a bunch of great guests: Mark Norman, uh, myself, obviously, fantastic guest. Um, And I believe he just had Adam Ray on as well. So go check out. I'm working on it. Um, If you're thinking about doing stand-up, go for it, man. Or woman. You might not be good. Most likely you're going to stink. It's kind of like going to Vegas or gambling. When you, like the first time you might do well and then you might not do well ever again. Um, (laughs) But it's... I was I was thinking like I I know I said in the intro that um my my name will never be on the on the comedy store wall and that's that's fine it's true but it's I can't recommend it enough as like a way to make friends to be social I don't know how to make friends as an adult I I don't I wish I did. What are you? What are you I, 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 if, if, if you don't work at an office or just anywhere, if you don't work with people, I don't know how to make friends. 
I know how to make online friends, I guess. You could play video games and talk to them. And, but, like, real life, like, you could touch them, friends. I have no idea. Other than stand-up. I guess you could start knitting. <laughs> um, but there's always an open mic. I know right now there aren't really that many open mics. But there are some, depending on where you live. And there are Zoom open mics. Uh, my, my biggest piece of advice that I can give you if you're thinking about doing stand-up. As shitty as Facebook is, as much as I hate Facebook, just search whatever city you're in, like a major city, not like, don't, don't search fucking Timbuktu, I don't know, think of a shitty city, um, whatever major city is near you, or state, if you're not near a major city, put that word in and then stand up comedy, and I guarantee there's a Facebook group about it. I guarantee. If you're in the LA area, there's LA comedy scene. There's also, uh, we talked about it on the podcast. There's uh, the Comedy Bureau is a way to find open mics. I know for a fact that there's the Bay Area Comedy Network. I know there's one in Houston. I know there's one in, or at least a couple in New York um, and Boston probably. So the, there's one near you. And, and just go there and there's ask about open mics, or maybe they have a, pay, a list of them somewhere, um, and there's Zoom ones now, but you can do from anywhere, so try it out, try it out, um, as I'm pretty sure is, is something on your mom's house, I, to be honest, I, I'm, I'm a little bit behind on your mom's house, so I don't really know what try it out means, it's most likely something either disgusting or sexual, um, <laughs> but, or, or both, <laughs> Um, but give it a shot. I'll say that. Give it a shot. Um, it, 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 it's one of the best things I've ever done in my life. And I look forward to continuing it as soon as humanly possible. Um, I'm still in Florida right now. I'm in Florida. Um, I do some exciting news. I guess I, uh, the soup kitchen where my dad, uh, volunteers, uh, is I'm helping them to start a podcast, the Soup Kitchen of Boynton Beach, Florida. So I'll I'll let you guys know when that's out. Um, I might be down here for another month. There's a chance I might be able to get the vaccine, um, and I'm gonna try that because I'm at risk and I have parents who are older and uh, I'm frankly sick and tired of being inside a little bit. I want to go out and not see that many people, but you know, occasionally see someone. Um, thank you to everyone on my Patreon, I'm super close to hitting 50 pounds gone, hopefully by the end of March at the latest, I would imagine it would hopefully be next week or the week after that, um, but you never know, um, so by the end of March, definitely, I should have hit, if I don't hit 50 pounds gone by the end of March, there's a problem, um, got a long way to go, probably at least another 100, if not more, um, but it's going well, I had an annoying day today, I, uh, I don't know how it happened, I, I brought my PlayStation with me to, to Florida, and it, it's been in a, in the box the entire month I've been here, more than a month that I've been here, and I was opening it, I was going to do a stream on Patreon, and I could have sworn I saw the power cord. I could have sworn that I saw the power cord, and then I just couldn't find it. I even called my mom in in Boston and had her look in my room, and she found... I wasn't hiding them, but before we left, I think I had told you guys that I I got uh, some Girl Scout cookies, but I left ha- half of them in uh, Boston, so I, I wouldn't... And I haven't... I honestly, Scouts Honor, have not touched one of them. Uh, they're still in my bag. Uh, maybe I'll have a couple... When I hit 50 pounds lost as a little treat. But I, I had my mom go check them, my room for the power cord. And she found the ones that I left in my room. And, and now they're her cookies. So that's actually probably for the best. Um, but I, 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 it's something like I, I got caught in the rain a little bit. Not too bad, but a little bit. And then I couldn't find And I thought I was going crazy. And then I went and I checked the bag with the cookies. And for some reason... The power cord was in there. So the moral of this story is um, always check the cookies. 
it was just you know I, it's a very minor thing but i just when when you know you found something or when you know something is there and you can't find it, it drives me absolutely bananas i actually almost considered not doing this episode i was like and you know what something did go wrong something went wrong i my video went my video didn't record but i liked the intro so i'm keeping it um so wow, today today was not my day. Also, I guess I guess maybe because I I uh, I have Avid, I have a really good editing software, and I can't get it to switch to my new computer. And the Avid wants to charge me like forty bucks to do tech support phone call. So if anyone works with Avid, uh, let me know. <laughs> I'm probably gonna have to buckle down and do that forty dollar tech support call, but um. Go check out my YouTube. I am putting up old episodes there. Most of them are going to be just audio. I am starting to record in video. And um, and so they'll have that. But that's it. I'm doing pretty well. I, I, I didn't want to do this in the intro. I wanted to keep it mostly uh, stand-up based. But overall, I'm doing great, guys. No complaints, really. I mean, there's always a... Com- I love complaining. I, re- I even had teachers... In school, like be like, you should stop complaining. I love complaining, um, but I really don't have too many right now. Other than other than than not having as much money as I'd like, um, which I guess is a constant complaint of mine. I don't think I've ever been happy with the amount of money that I have. Um, I'm doing pretty well. I'm happy with it. I I am looking forward to having. Um, an adult sized bed again. I've been on twin beds and now I guess now technically I'm on a cot. It's a good cot. It's like a memory foam one, but uh I am looking forward to having an adult sized bed again. And I think I feel like when you're talking about beds, it's time to, to cut your losses and say, uh, thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you for everyone who has done my Patreon or has uh did a consult consultation with me. Over the last month, uh, check out my link tree. It's at both of my social medias. And you know what? I'll even put a, a link to it in the description. Uh, it has links to YouTube. It has links to where you can listen to the podcast. It has links to my my uh, consultation and my Jewish heritage. Who knows? Um, and that's it. Thank you very much to Matt. And uh, we have some great episodes coming up. Thank you for listening to What Was I Thinking? That might have been the first time I said it. Maybe I said it once in the intro. Um, but thank you. And and this is just the beginning of the ride, you guys. So we're, we're, we're going to have a lot more to come. But for now, thank you. I hope you're well. Please stay safe. Please be nice. And um, take a nap. You deserve it. Have a good one. I'll see you next week. Bye.